Hello, Magic Facebook land. It's Silf Donald Hawkins here from Raining Spirit Dojo or Shinden, and it is eight o'clock. Yes, I just realised that my <laughs> clock on the wall is still set an hour uh, wrong, <laughs> an hour later for daylight saving time, and I just had a sudden moment of like, oh my god, it's actually an hour later. But no, I can confirm it is Friday the seventeenth of April. So hello, people, as you're starting to uh, to join and and uh, come on board, I'll give everyone a couple of minutes to make their way over. Hopefully, you guys are well and you've had a good week, especially since um, I've seen some of you on Wednesday night, or at least chatted to you um, in the meditation video. So I thought we'd start the the live feed tonight just like a few minutes early, so I could just say hi and. Um, if any of you would like to type in and chit chat, let me know how you're going. Um, remember, Hoshin students, tomorrow, Saturday, April the 18th at 2 pm, we're having our first Zoom party uh, online social get together because it's been like a month now, I think, since our last class. Um, I'm pretty sure that this, yeah, this Friday today. It was a month ago that we had our last uh, class before the awesome lockdown. 20-somethings of March. So, I hope that you're well. I am getting ready tonight. Uh, we're going to use the magic blackboard, <laughs> which is partially why I'm here at Hoshin Den headquarters, Running Spirit Dojo HQ, and with a trusty bucket of chalk. You know how much I love using chalk on the blackboards <laughs> to express my ideas. Hey, Stacey, welcome. Um, so tonight will be a good opportunity for me to, um, to get up from just talking and use talking and symbols. So um, bonus points to everyone at home who <laughs> loves watching me talk and write things on the board. You're kind of, you just get months of this. I hope that you're looking forward to it. Um, what else? So we'll give everyone a couple of, um, yeah, another couple of minutes to join on. Uh, those of you who are already part of the chat, type in the chat and let me know how you're going. I'm keen to, to find out that you're well. Oh, good, Lisa, you're well, I hear. And Stacey, you're good. Hello. I hope that um, you guys are just finding positive outcomes. And as always, I said in the, the first video that we did a month ago, because um, this is session number four. Yeah, wow tonight, um, that this is really a time to apply strategy, and I know it can be a stressful time, and that it's not always easy to apply strategy under stress and duress, but that's really what we've been practicing, those of you who've been studying with me for the last one year, all the way up to the last 10 years, um, that's, that's what we've been practicing, how to apply strategy, strategy under stress. <laughs> We've just been doing it in, uh, uh, oh, good, Lisa, you've got, we've been doing it in a, um, uh, like a physical scenario, yeah, in a martial arts setting, but what's not to say that you can't do that under the stress of being criticised verbally or being in lockdown due to a massive economic collapse, <laughs> you know, and, uh, oh, sorry, did I say that, um, <clears throat> due to a virus uh, that will lead to a massive economic collapse, so this this time is really just an opportunity to practice more. You know, if you're, if you're here now in um, coronavirus time, hey, Hannah, and, and you're confused about how to approach the circumstances, um, you need to go back and just put some thought to what you've studied and, and imagine and draw up an imagination of... Um, of of how it is that you were able to do that on the mats, go back to a class that maybe you have a good memory of an awesome class, you were just on fire, god of martial arts, and, and remember what it was like when you were, there was lots of stuff coming at you, and, and you were able just to find this really, really good response, really good steady stream that, uh, that you could run, and that, that's, that's how you were able to, to defend against that physical technique or well that's how you were able to to just regulate your breathing or that's how you were able to kind of stabilize yourself or find some stability 
in the middle of this this thing. G'day Jeff, welcome to the video. So I'm still going to give everyone another couple of minutes uh, to join on, those who are joining us for tonight. Like I said at the start of a couple of minutes ago, um, moving on from last week, last week we talked a lot about principles. I wanted to, to just express and discuss uh, my idea of principles and principles relating to martial arts, but principles as concepts. And then the previous week before that was looking at phases and qualities. So I was talking about Hoshin Den and about what I did, how it was that I, uh, that I took that idea from, from my original Hoshin study and the other uh, areas that I studied and actually wanted to hone in and really clarify and draw out in a, in a stupidly obvious way um, the qualities of movement, yeah? the, the isolation of the qualities of relating. And really, I think that martial arts is about human relationship and it's about the, the interplay of connection and communication. You know, if, if, you've, got, if you've got this straight down the line barreling, bah, and you've got someone who's straight down the line barreling back, well, that's, that's a dynamic, that's a relationship dynamic, and that's gonna have certain outcomes, yeah? There's gonna be certain pros and cons, and the winner, the loser, the success, the failure rate of that is gonna depend less on, um, on uh, opposing concepts and more on strength, inherent strength, or strategic setups, yeah? If there's two of these things here on this side and one on that. So then you get back to the Sun Tzu and the art of war and these, these great stories, you know, he with three sheep overcomes he with 12 sheep minus a river. And you're like, oh yeah, strategy, it's all strategy. So an alternative perspective is thinking, what is an, what is a, a, an advantageous response? If there's this down, down, down line, maybe an advantageous response is to just get out of the way. You know, like if you're standing on a train track and the train's hurtling towards you and it's very obvious that the train is just gonna win, yeah, on all possible scenarios there, why would you stand on the train track and try to try to apply the same quality back to the train? Hey, Travis, like you just don't have that. You know, you don't have the structure. You don't have the. You're not made of steel. You're not moving at. I don't know about you, but I'm not moving at 300 kilometers an hour in a straight line, made of steel with a diesel engine behind me. So I'm never going to be able to fight that. That's like the, the two straight lines going head to head. But this one has strategized strength. This one's made of steel. <laughs> yeah, it's being propelled at 300 kilometers an hour. So it's a no-brainer that there needs to be a, th a rethink of an advantageous scenario. And in that train analogy, what's the most advantageous thing, the, the, the response in the, that relationship dynamic is change the angle. Just get off the north line and look at it from an east-west perspective. Just get off the train track and wait for the train to go. And the train's super strong this way and really weak that way. You know, I'm sure you could stand there and if you had a shoe made of steel, you'd kick the train off the track. You know? Um, I've seen trains derail and it, it doesn't take much, but they only derail on this, this weak dynamic, yeah? They don't derail straight on, <laughs> usually. So, it's just a metaphor and an analogy. Um, Hoshin, for me, always expressed really clearly this idea that there are strategies and the success in any particular scenario, whether it's physically, mentally or emotionally, is going to really de depend on your ability to read the scenario, quickly gain an understanding of the dynamic at play, and then make choices as to how you're going to respond. And if you choose, if you choose a dynamic that's just directly at odds with the dynamic that you're responding to, well, you learn the lesson, you pay for it, and once you clean yourself up off the street, you try again next time. <laughs> you try a different approach. Yeah, um, I can't think of how many times I have attempted the same response in the same type of conversation with the same types of arguments and the same types of people and they never win and I never ever succeed and I don't even mean succeed in terms of winning the argument I never actually even get what I want which might be just just um, to to kind of move on from the conversation uh, my approach has just kind of constantly kept eroding away at, at my ability to get what I keep saying that I want which might be peace and harmony and blah 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 you know whatever it is so at one point, at some point, I obviously had to go back and think to myself, okay, I'm the common denominator in all of these, in all of my uh, relationship issues, in, and I just mean in general with people, in all of my, my dynamics with um, disagreements or, or opposition with others. If I never ever achieve the outcome that I want, there's something wrong. <laughs> there's something incorrect. I'm choosing 
the wrong kind of approach for these particular people. And, um, and I've talked about this a lot in my classes. You know, those of you who, who know me well are probably laughing at home. You know even some of the circumstances that I'm talking about. So keep that smug grin off your face. <laughs> but I, um, and you've watched me. You've watched me attempt and it doesn't work. And I attempt again and it doesn't work. And I attempt again and it doesn't work. And so it's just funny. You know, eventually you have to laugh. So if we draw that right forward to today, I talked a lot about qualities and phases. So the phases just being my observation of how these qualities change and move like seasonal cycles and how we have to observe and explore them all. It's not that one of them is, is the correct one and the rest are like sub-characters. It's not a Dragon Ball Z episode where there's Goku, a.k.a. you know Fire Carter. Oh, and then there's all these support characters who kind of die off, but it's okay. Yeah, Wind Carter and you know Water Carter and the Lesser Carter, but Fire Carter. It's not like that. that that's a good, <laughs> that's a modern hero story. That's not what's going on. In reality, they're all Goku, yeah? It's Fire Goku, Wind Goku, Water Goku. Um, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, then you're obviously not into anime in the way I am into it. Um, there's Earth Goku, Metal Goku, Mist Goku, fire, you know, like Clay Goku. They're just, they're just aspects, and different ones will become useful under different circumstances. So this series of Friday night videos, I'm really enjoying, I hope you guys are as well, um, finally putting some video recordings of all of this kind of theory. I've talked about it for 10 years. Um, never really recorded it, though. Hmm. It's going to bite me in the backside, isn't it? Um, that I want to actually discuss the, the framework of Hoshinden. And in that, by accident, I will attempt to discuss my interpretation of the framework of Hoshin Jutsu. But um, uh, I'm not going to pro pro attempt to, or even present uh, to be an authority on that in any ways. But I can talk deeply about Hoshin Den, <laughs> my little get around sneaky uh, strategy there. So tonight's video is all about stupa, S-T-U-P-A. Going to be talking about the, the, this idea that's come from, um, from ancient India, and we see it in Mahayana Buddhism. It travels right through. You see this in Kundalini Yoga, and you see the same shapes and symbols and, and the dialogue in, um, in even more modern forms. There's, there's some fantastic books. I can put some of these in the um, uh, links to some of these books in the description later on. I'm pointing down because I think it's under the video. Um, and there's, there's comments about these exact things in, in Reiki books from Mikhail Yasu from the early 1900s. There's discussions of this in, in um, uh, Chinese uh, Qigong. And the symbols are drawn differently, but the structure and the shape of this this icon is the same, and it means the same thing. And so we're just going to talk about that tonight. If you've attended any of my classes, you probably know what I'm about to get into. <laughs> so 10 points to you. You can talk along at home. I'm going to move the camera to my magically pre-prepared black painted wall and my glass of water. And I'm going to grab my chalk so we can do some drawing. Now, hopefully you guys can still hear me. I don't know how the microphone is on this device, but I'm gonna be standing back here. Thumbs up if you can still hear me. Yes! No one put their thumbs up. Great, let's just assume that that's to it. So, stupa is, is a concept. Um, we see it in modern pagoda development. So, in India, in Japan, in China, temples that have five steep levels, yeah? These pagoda, ah yes, thank you, you can hear me. These, um, these levels, they represent something. They, they represent different qualities, different spiritual ideologies from um, three heighted pagodas and different ideologies from um, um, seven and nine heighted uh, levels and temples and pagodas. So this one, we're gonna start at the base. Okay. We're gonna draw. A cube. I know, it's really getting out there. So, <laughs> this base is the beginning, yeah? This is chi, this is grounding. So chi, Japanese, that concept is earth, yeah? Ground. And on top of chi, on top of, of the, the cube, we're going to draw the circle. And the circle, which represents the navel, is sweet. So this is water, this is the watery aspect. This is the, the circle sits on top of the solid base, yeah? And there's, there's an ideology of this in Bagua, in ancient Chinese Bagua, 
um, and the hexagrams. If you guys have ever seen the, the trigrams, I'll draw an example later. Um, they say that when the water is held by the ground, then things are correct. Yeah? When the ground is held by water, bad, bad juju. <laughs> That's not good. When the ground is, is held by water, the ground will dissolve and disintegrate. There's no structure there. When the water is held, when the lake is held in the, in the solid clay of the, of the mountain, well then, then long-term consistency can exist for the, for the lake. Yeah? So there's a reason for these, these stagings. The next one that sits on top of this is the triangle shape. This is ka. Ka jitsu. Yeah? So ka is fire. It's this concept of, um, of generativeness and, and upliftment. And then on top of ka, look at that, I think you fit it into the video, yes. On top of ka, we've got ooh, this wonderful crescent shape, which is fu, wind. So the wind aspect, yeah? And they relate that as part of the physical form to um, uh, meaning not, not the spirit, but the mind. So the identified mind, the thoughts of me, my, who I am, what time it is, where I am, I'm a baker, I'm a plumber, that kind of thing. And then we have this awesome little floating dot. So ku is like um, emptiness, void, Disparate, disparation. In this, this is called the stupa. Boring. You see right through history. You travel through Japan, and you'll see you'll see actual statues of this. Go to the temples, and you see pieces like this. And um, <laughs> ah, that's a good point, Hannah. I didn't even realize that the letters are back to front. Ah, I will edit it out. Um, so Reeve made me an awesome thing last year <laughs> you guys can work it out so this from reeve last year um he made this for me oh no no this year sorry um can you see what it is now this is the incense holder that reeve made for me it's the stupa there's the ground cube there's so there's chi there's sui there's ka there's fu and it's an incense holder the smoke of the incense itself is ku now that's awesome. Thank you, Reeve. I love it. You wander through temples, you'll see this carved out of stone. Obviously the ball isn't floating because they're not, they're still human, um, it's attached. But the idea here is that these four components make up the material solidity of earth. So from Mahayana Buddhism, there's a concept from Shakyamuni Buddha that, where he's talking about how um, and he mentions this in, in one sutra called the Mahayana, no, sorry, the um, uh, Maharahulu Vajra Sutra. He's talking to his son, um, Rahul. And he comments to his son about how there really are only four things. There's four things that make up everything in the universe. And so he coins these, and obviously translated from the, from the Pali, but he coins them as earth, water, fire, and air, as being the the things which under his, uh, under his meditation, under his attempts to, in Vipassana, to, to watch, to observe, um, the, the posture of observation, his attempt to observe pain, shoulder pain, and see what, what happened to the pain. And so he finds that the pain divides under his gaze into two separate things that are no longer called pain, they, and he calls them something, you know, um, I can't remember exactly, but he calls them something like, like um, sharp and, and um, uh, hot. And so then he decides, okay, well, what happens if I, if I look at sharp? I apply my mental focus to sharp. And he finds I mean, that the sharp quality further divides into sub-qualities. And he just continues this for 21 days until, until he has found that um, under his mental gaze, there's no further uh, splitting off. There's no further sub-categorization. And he says at that point that his meditation is complete, <laughs> he's finished, his vipassana, and, and that what he has found is that, that the experience of sensation can be divided down into earth, water, fire, and air. And he just coins those as terms. Really interesting how our Western culture, so my Western culture, I shouldn't make notes for you at home, sorry, um, 
uh, my Western culture and this, this uh, Gaelic Celtic ideologies of, um, of uh, nature worship, this earth, air, water, fire, and spirit concept that we have, that, that all shoots up from, from India. And, and this, this Indian idea just, just travels out through trade routes. You know? It's quite incredible to, to conceive of how that's come about. Um, one of the things that Shakyamuni did, and it's really important to comment on this, is that he said that none of these individual aspects would be obvious unless there was a distinction between them. If there was not something that was separate from them, but, um, but not a unique or identifiable quality of itself, then you wouldn't, they wouldn't be separate. They'd just be one. And so his discussion is that um, there is a, there's a fifth quality. You know, it's not an element. They, they're so void or emptiness or space. And then in, in a West, we, we comment, we call that spirit or akasha. So this concept is that that, that is the thing that shows the delineation between them. That if you've got, if you've got something that has the quality of, of uh, solidity, something that has the quality of liquidity, that where they meet, the boundary where they meet, if you pour the water into the bowl, the very boundary upon where they meet, that boundary is what defines the difference of the two. The, the, a floating ball of water, that by itself, in a universe of only water, wouldn't, that wouldn't be called water. That would just be oneness. Yeah? There wouldn't be anything to distinct, there, there wouldn't be any distinction between it and anything to reference it against. So this concept is that there is this, this non-tangible um, uh, quality that draws lines and, and actually divides the qualities of these other things. And so that, that forms the framework within which um, the material universe stands upon, if that makes sense. This, this drawing, this stupa, shows that the four fundamental uh, elements and qualities, earth, water, fire and wind, I had to read it backwards myself there, um, that they are related, they are connected, they sit on top of each other and they, they require the, the stability in that order. But ku, this emptiness, this void, yeah, this, this spirit idea, the, the distinction between them, that's, that's separate. It's part of the whole, but it's not actually attached directly. And that's what, the, that's what it's meant to represent in that, in that form. So the stupa, you see this, I'll keep doing some drawings for you. <coughs> So you'll see this in Japan, you find the temples, you see how my art, I'm not a very, I'm not a very good artist, yeah, uh, I have to just struggle to think about how to draw a 3D shape. Okay, so I've got my little temple, I've got my trees, there's my steps, no one write in and knock my <laughs> the quality of my drawing. And the, the roof is really specific. So you'll find that that the roof oh my god. The roof <laughs> it's almost embarrassing to show you. The roof has these these separate sections. If I colour it in, you don't know that I did it wrong. So that's not too bad, hey? It's pretty bad, but it's not too bad. So in this, you can see that the roof is supposed to have three levels. I think I'll just talk about it and not draw it. Um, so that, that temple that, uh, that is representing um, its, its spiritual ideology. In Japan, Shintoism divides things into three, the three great islands, um, how they were formed as a spiritual philosophy from, from um, ancient... Japanese culture, so ancient, like pre-Shintoism, I suppose, uh, well, pre-Shugyo, um, and it's like uh, this idea that um, uh, there are three sacred things at work, and the idea comes from, <laughs> I'm going to get in a lot of trouble if I say this, uh, you can see in China that there, in the Bagua, there's, there's an idea from about 4,000 years ago that talks about, like Yellow Emperor kind of era, talks about how the idea of one gives birth to the idea of two, the idea of two gives birth to the idea of three, and the idea of three gives birth to the idea of many. 
I'll take from that what you will. <laughs> um, so if, if we found that there was a temple in Japan in, in one of the, the beautiful parklands and it had three layers in its, its pagoda roof, we could go up and we could be pretty sure that it's, it's a Shinto temple. Yeah, it's, it's relating to Shinto. And, um, and if we go up and we will look at, if we were to look at the end caps on the temple, so where the roof, uh, the beautiful roof tiles spear up at the end of the section, there's these wonderful circular caps. And, um, and often you find on Shinto temples, the, they'll have this three, three teardrop shaped pattern. Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh. Teardrops. It's just teardrops. You should be able to do this. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's not too bad. Actually, it's really bad. Um, <laughs> Colour it in so it looks better. Hey, okay. Actually, 10 points. Come on, give me a thumbs up. That's, that's pretty good. Um, now, you'll see those as, as that's the symbol of the, the picture cast into the end caps. They're made of stone or metal, plates, copper sometimes. And it's representing this, this threefold idea, just like the roofs, just like the, the pagoda roof, um, and, and this concept of Shinto, of Japan being formed, the three great islands being formed uh, in a, a, this, uh, from a, a battle with a deity or multiple deities. So if we now take that idea and we look at temples in Japan, which are... Mahayana temples, or, or so Mahayana Buddhism in Japan uh, sort of became Mikyo, Mikyo Buddhism, and they they generally have five layers on their roof, five uh, five stupa, yeah, or the stupa, sorry, five pieces of the stupa, um, and the end caps of those temples, cucumber, no, what are we talking about? Huh? The end caps of the oh. I see. The end caps of those temples, um, they usually just have five dots. Now, tell me if this is familiar to you. Tell me if you've seen this before. I'm not going to redraw the temple. It was pretty bad. Maybe I can do some kind of roofing line. <laughs> no, I'll do it. Can you see that? Woo! Now you might not be able to see there are actually five to the roof. The end caps of those will look like this. Now where have you seen that before? We're back to the five forms. Yeah? The, so they're called the gogyo. The, the five precepts, the five principles, the five concepts. And um, uh, this, this idea is not unique to Japanese martial arts, it's not unique to Japanese culture. This is, a, this is a human archetypal, symbological relationship with, um, with universal processes. Yeah? So in this idea, you can see straight away, we're getting something about this number five. Yeah, thank you. Um, we're back to this number five. We're back to these shapes. Yeah. Da -da. Ooh, that's cool. It's like I'm right there. Now, the, gog the, the, um, uh, the stupa, we use that in martial arts to explore the structure of the human being. And it borrows this straight out of, um, of, of ancient India. This was presented... Maybe not necessarily directly, but this was um, uh, appropriated to to be a method for personal development and enlightenment. So that if if um, you were a student of Mahayana and you wanted to to experience ascension, you wanted to experience nirvana, the the to blow out, then it was it was basically put forward to you that a method to do that is to literally move through the body and, and, and ascend the physical form. Yeah. Um, 
spiritually. So there would be the discussion to start at the base level, start with the emotions of the root. And how it's done is through meditation. It's meditating on the, the earth quality, the, the meditating on the, the earth qualities, the internal and external earth qualities. And obviously what is meant by that is not soil, <laughs> sand, granite, mm, granite. It's, um, it's, it's the concepts of the things that are within you relating to the earth quality. And you can, you can see, you can even get that kind of language in some of the, the sutra, some of the Mahayana sutra, where, where Shakyamuni Buddha is saying, um, if you, if you realise that, when you get to the point where you realise that, that there's no distinction between you, the earth qualities that make up you, this, and the earth qualities that you see around you, then you can disengage from the emotional turmoil of um, identification of those qualities. So, for example, um, there's in the Rahul, um, Maharahula Vajra Sutra, where he talks to his son, Rahul, and says to him, if you, if, if you look, the, um, the earth is not offended when you, when you throw your rubbish on the ground. He's talking about uh, when, you, when you pour your buckets of compost out you know, into the ground to rot away, or you bury you know, the, uh, a body that rots in the ground, the earth isn't offended by that. So why would you be offended? If you're made of the, these qualities, if you're made of the qualities of earth, why would you be offended? And it's this meditation on like disengaging um, a sense of identification. Like, well, but I, it's like, oh, all right. And it starts to, it starts to kind of thin out the, the gap or the distinction between that which is you and that which is other. Yeah? So then he moves on and he says the same thing we go up to Sui. Goes up to, obviously in Mahayana they're not called these. These, <laughs> these are the Japanese terms. Yeah? And the symbology changes. So usually inside um, uh, each of these sections, just as a little side note, if you see these in statues, there'll be um, uh, just kanji drawn, yeah? So just, just the kanji for each, where's my finger? For each piece will be drawn inside there, not the, not the romaji, not the words. And um, the symbols are very, very similar to um, old Sanskrit. So like ancient Indian um, script that, that is drawn and written in exactly the same shapes in exactly the same way. Amazing. It's been thousands of years. We're still drawing the same little pictures. Now, Chakamuni moves up to, to water. He says to his son, okay, um, the aspects of you that are like water. And he goes on to describe the physical manifestations of that. The, the stomach acids, the juices, the urine, the, the um, tears, the blood. You know, and so he, he describes the tangible manifested, um, manifestations of those qualities. And then describes external, all that is external of water. You know, he talks about the ocean, the liquids, the, the rain, um, the oil, things like that. Things that fit into the, the water quality category. And says, when you, when you are dirty and you wash yourself in the creek, when you, when you wash yourself and your clothes in the river, is the river offended? Uh, does the river take, take personal um, pride against, you know, having your dirty clothes in the river? And says no. The river, the river just is rivering, and and that's just part of the river's quality. The river's quality is that it it can. I was like, sorry. The water's quality is that it can clean in that kind of sense. It's just a quality of water. And so he says. So if if you know you're you're washing your dirty clothes in the river, and the water doesn't seem to be offended, why would that which is water of you be offended when someone comes and cleans, wants to clean their own dirty baggage on you? Or, you know, when someone comes and, uh, and wants to, to uh, he says in the, in, it's quite, it's nice and harsh. He says, you know, if someone comes up, if you go and you spit in the water, is the water offended? So if someone comes and spits at you, why would you be offended? If the watery qualities of you aren't offended by that, why would the watery quality, if, if the watery qualities of the world aren't offended by that, why would the watery qualities of you be offended by that? It's an interesting Meditative philosophy. So again, it's like meditating on that idea is to lead to a sense of disassociation from the identification of that. No, I am, you know, this is me. It's like, no, no, this is just process. This is just happening. This is literally just that, but with some arms and legs and, and it does stuff and it's animated. That 
up there, that is more related to this which is occurring, the processes yeah, of non-tangible form, things like who I think I am, uh, the concepts of language, the concepts of something like mathematics, the ideas that have no tangible standing. There, there is absolutely nothing that you could do to, to put them into an object. Yeah? I can't say, I can't put maths in a glass. I can't put my, who I think I am in a glass. I can probably blend up this flesh and pour into a cup, but then I haven't, I haven't blended up who I think I am. I've only blended up the combinations of the basic elements and the properties of those. Yeah? So all I'll have in the cup and this is what Shakyamuni is trying to get across. All I'll have in the cup is a combination of the fundamental qualities, earth, water, fire, and air, and they'll be in the cup. I can't, I can't grab that. That, that cool, that um, idea of, of uh, emptiness, which is where some the, the, the concepts of that which we call spirit and shen come from, that's not, that's not puttable in a glass. It's not glassable. <laughs> because it's not containable. It's not containable because it has no structure. If something doesn't have structure or substance, well then it can't, it can't be, uh, the rules of physics can't apply to it in terms of mass and weight and volume. You know, it can't be um, identified. And yet, we are constantly experiencing the effects of that, yeah? So even though I can't quantify it in, and I can't, I can't locate it into a, into a box, nevertheless, I am, I am experiencing the consequences of its existence in my life, in my choices, in my decision making. And um, the discussion, if you really take it to a far out point, you get to, to this notion that this idea of emptiness, which, which does nothing more than show the distinction between, between the solid object, between the, the, the tangible qualities. What I mean by that is the emptiness doesn't have qualities of its own. You can only describe emptiness with terms that are anti the four fundamentals. So you can't describe emptiness without referencing something that's full, if that makes sense. It's, a, it's, it's more of a language trap than it is a philosophical trap. It's because our language is dualistic by nature. So um, if I was to describe it and say, oh, it's not watery, well, I haven't described it. I've only described things that all other possible things that aren't water. I've also described accidentally earthy things, fiery things, windy things. And I go, well, it's not watery and it's not fiery. Well, I've still described windy things and watery things. And now I'm kind of giving a wishy-washiness to that it's, it's kind of in between watery and fiery. And eventually I say, it's not earthy and it's not watery and it's not fiery and it's not windy. And then I run out of I run out of reference material, and so this idea is that um, that emptiness is literal. It's it's not that it's vacant. It's that it can't be described directly. It can't be experienced directly through these other forms. It can only be experienced at the edge of where these things meet. It can only be experienced. Um, the relationship between you and another human individual can only be experienced at the meeting point of your of your connection. If, um, if you're in a martial arts setting and you're grabbing, you're, you're kumi or whatever, it's only at the point of your, your meeting where all of the power distribution and, and change occurs. Yeah? All, that, all that relationship occurs at the boundary between the skin of the two of you, you know, the, the grab. Like That's where that, that is. And you might, you might use structure in your body to help, to assist whatever the technique is you're trying to do. But, but if you don't have a partner... If it's just you, there's no distinction. There's no relationship. Yeah, you can only you can only uh, study as if the wind is what your relationship is against. Or you know, we talk about like the Tengu, the, the bird head demon gods that look suspiciously like ancient Egyptian gods. I have to just say, and um, <clears throat> and so then you get into your mind this this um, imaginary practice of you and a partner. And you have, to, you have to create a reference because without the reference, there isn't, there isn't any exchange. Yeah? There's, there's nothing going on there. So if, if you take it to its logical conclusion, the idea is that that which we think is us, that which I, I not me, the identification of me, this body, this form, this name, but that which is, that which is happening beyond the processes, 
So our culture calls that spirit. Chinese culture call that shen. That that happening is the same thing as emptiness. And its, its experience is found in the what it's not, if that makes sense. That you can't sit down and just penetrate with your, with your mental gaze. You can't penetrate the soul. Like, if that was doable, we, there'd be libraries of books. <laughs> <laughs> There'd probably just be one book. There'd just be a YouTube channel methodology of people experiencing phenomenal senses of oneness. And that's not the case. It's um, why do you think the meditations, especially in things like Vipassana, why do you think that they're based around the observation of um, external and internal sensations? It's because those are the things. Funny that we have five sensations. Eh? Those, those are the, I'm saying about this number, those are the, the starting point because you need references. And it's when you sit down and you go, huh. I'm hearing depth of, of audible sensation and I've come to understand, this has come to understand that that's not this. Audible sensation, sound sensation is not this. Ah, huh, okay, and you move on. And this is like, this is the, the experience through your, your meditations, yeah? You sit down, ah, the, the sensation, this one's fun. The, the sensation of body, of weight, pressure, where it meets the ground. In the identified thought, super easy to be confused and think, yeah, I'm feeling the pressure of me uh, in relationship to the ground, my, my body, you know, like the, the mass of my body bearing through uh, a small section of my skin in front of my legs, I'm sitting on my shins. It's like, no, 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 that's not me, that's this body. So it becomes a philosophy. And the question is like, ah, oh, well, that, that sensation's not this yeah that sensation is the tangible qualities of the physical form butting up against the tangible qualities of other physical densities you go okay well i'm not sound and i'm not tactile pressure you go i'm not colors i'm not sight i'm not uh i'm not smells i'm not tastes and you, you eventually run out of reference material in a way that moves you on to, to abstract material. Am I symbols? You know, and your meditation takes you to this point just, just accidentally, accidentally, just uh, as a natural pre, uh, recourse. You say, am I, am I symbol? Am I symbology? And you're like, no, I can draw, I can still find a line. There's still a distinction that I'm capable of exploring between that which is symbol and that which is this. You're like, oh, I guess I'm not symbol. You're like, am I, am I vibration? And you're like, ah, oh, <laughs> probably, but that's a concept. Yeah? You're like, ah, oh, am I concept? No, and what you discover is that you can't ever find out what you are. It's one of the fantastic trap. <laughs> it's, it's like, that's the trap. That's, that's, that's the gold right there. If you can get that, if you, if you get to the point where you are just, you put your arms up in, in total despair <laughs> because, because you've spent 20 years, 50 years, looking for you and you can't find you doesn't matter how far and wide you've looked you've looked and looked and looked and looked and looked and looked and here under every rock and you can't find you if you can get to that point and you just drop into infinite despair then you have a chance of really experiencing um, the the reward of that process which is this understanding that ah by my nature i can't be found yeah can you imagine that that that's beautiful <laughs> it's very poetic there isn't there isn't anything that's findable so i really can't draw a distinction between that which is this and that which is infinity that which is this and that which is god that which is this and that which is spirit that which is this and that which is maths that which is this and that which is kind of other really abstract um non-tangible forms those those things all blur together and, and the idea being that there's a sense of enlightenment, there's a, there's a realisation. Um, it's, it's, I won't say revelation, it's always being revealed, it's us who's catching up. So it's a realisation that, that if that's what's occurring, then this isn't, this isn't me, this, isn't, this body isn't me, this is, this is a wonderful experiencing vessel. <laughs> This isn't that which I call me. This is what I identify as. Those are separate things. And 
those, those philosophies, they come from these kinds of meditations. And they become as, they come as quite, sound strange now maybe too, but they, they become very logical, very rational um, uh, ideas at that point where you, you decide at some point, if you can't be found, then I'm going to stop looking. And once you stop looking to find you, the irony, and I'm sure you all know what I'm about to say, the irony is that you're found. And it's because you were never lost to begin with. If you, um, if you were to say to someone, oh, quick, how do, I, how, do I get, how do I get down? I need to get down. I need to, get, I need to just get down right now, really quick. The question is not necessarily uh, a bad question, but the context of the question doesn't make any sense. What do I mean by down? Uh, am I up? <laughs> Was I automatically up? Does, it, does down automatically suggest that I'm on a ladder? If I'm sitting on the ground, how can I get any more down? And what we realize is that's, that's, not, that's not a universal philosophy. That's a trap of, of our limited perspective of the world around us. Because I can look above my current level of sight, uh, my current horizontal level of sight, and I can see things that are higher in reach and I decide that those things are up. I've created an abstract idea that there's an up. In order for there to be an up, I've accidentally also created the abstract idea that there must be a down, because in order for them to have separateness, there must be something they're referenced against. So there's up, there's down, and now I use that to, to experience my relationship. That's fine if I'm talking about the world, if I'm talking about light bulbs, roofs, uh, it's really useful if I'm like, oh, I need to, I need to build a shelf, <laughs> you know, practical things using these four fundamental materials. That's all good. That works. That's, that's a disaster if I try to identify myself with those concepts. If I try to find myself, find that which is I in, in the, the concepts of the material realm. It's just never going to happen. It's like, and I think I said this a few weeks ago, imagine if you were attempting to use your microphone to, to record what colour the mats are at the dojo. You'd be like, all of you would kind of squint and you'd be like, no, I, Sensei, I think you've misunderstood. <laughs> That's not the purpose of the tool. And I'd be like, ha ha, yes, 10 points to you. It's not the purpose of the tool. What do you do? You get a different tool. You get the tool that is correct for that. And then, and then it's easy. You know, you're not scratching your hair. So if the purpose of the tool of relating with contrasting reality, duality, black and white, up and down, yeah, if, if the purpose of that is practical, it's extremely practical, that's how we survive. That's how I know the difference between what not to eat and what to eat. I know the difference between driving down the road and driving off a cliff. Those things are really important, and I highly recommend maintaining your practical, um, neurological, contrasting mind. Absolutely. But do not attempt to use your contrasting thinking to identify oneness. It's impossible. How could you possibly attempt to use a tool that, whose whole purpose is to divide and contrast in reference? How can you use that to find something that's non-contrastable and non-referenceable? You're just wasting your time. And the beauty of spiritual philosophy and these, these old philosophies is that the teachers wouldn't even tell you that. They just let you go and they just wait and set you up to fail. Like all of these ancient um, uh, practices, they're really setting, they set the student up to fail miserably to discover that there's absolutely no possible way that they can achieve what they were told to do. And they have to go back with their tail between their legs and, and admit defeat. And then finally, once they've admitted defeat, because they can't get their goal, then the next stage of the, of the study continues. So Shakyamuni Buddha, and I've said this, Shakyamuni Buddha famously um, said in one of his first sutra to his disciples, he goes back and he just talks to people listening to him. And he says, he says to them, right, you suffer because you desire. And this is classic, you know, think of classic um, modern Buddhism. You suffer because you desire. Okay, if you can eradicate desire, you can eradicate suffering. And they go, great. And they run off and they go away. And 10 years later, some of them come back, scratch their heads, looking a bit, a bit, you know, unshaven. And they say, Master, we've discovered a problem. I now desire so passionately not to desire that I have discovered a trap. I can't 
move towards the goal of non-desire without desiring to do so. I'm stuck. And then Chakamuni says, great, now we're ready for step one. <laughs> and it's like the first 10 years were just to really kind of shake you into this idea that you're not going to get there from here. You know, you're not going to, you cannot use thought to think beyond thinking. That's, that's impossible. And so you think, oh, I need another tool. If your only tool that you've ever discovered is thought, well, then you're not going to be, you're not going to be convinced otherwise. You are going to have to, you're going to have to beat your head against the wall of thought for so long until you show yourself the limitation of thinking. And then only at that point, at that point of limitation, will you accept or even allow yourself to be a victim of acceptance enough that you'll be prepared to entertain the possibility that there's other tools. And until you get to that point, it's not even worth having a discussion. So, all because you'll only attempt to, to think your way to the answer. So all of these methodologies, these brilliant teachers of the past, they set you up with impossible activities. They say things like, okay, <laughs> yeah, that's right, Jeff, totally. They, they set you up with this notion of like, well, I want you to, I want you to really show me, oh, here's a good one, you'll love this. This is, this is an old Buddhist story. Um, there's a king who is, uh, uh, you know, lording over his lands and, and he finds that it's very, it's very tough, finds it very stressful. And uh, he's, he's just can't, he can't sleep at night. He says that his mind is just, it's just running all the time. It's very weighed down. And he says that to one of his, his uh, you know, his sages, um, find me the, the wisest man in the land. And they go out on horseback and they find their way to this cave where this, this monk is sitting and the, the, again, the king or the, the prince gets off and says to the monk, Monk, I've heard that you are the wisest of the, the people in this land. Please help me um, pacify my mind. Uh, it drives me wild. I cannot sleep at night. I, I will give you anything. I'll give you, my, I'll give you all the gold in the treasury if you can please pacify my mind. And the monk says, okay. <laughs> first, <laughs> and this is brilliant. He says, first, I will take the payment. <laughs> You know, so the, the treasure chest comes off the back, all the gold and jewels and diamonds. It says, put it in the back of the cave. <clears throat> the monk says, okay, now, sit down. I will pacify your mind for you. And the prayer, oh, thank God. And the king's so thankful and he's, you know, sweating. He's been waiting for this day. And the monk says, okay, present your mind. And then the king obviously says, well, well I, there's nothing to present. When I, when I look for mine, I, I can't find anything. And the monk says, ah, oh, good, excellent. You can go now. <laughs> Success. <laughs> and obviously there's this discussion that ensues between them. More of, I think it kills the monk in a funny part of the tale. It's like, that's, that's, that's literal. If you cannot present something, if you're like, this, I need this to be fixed. My mind is the problem. If you can fix my mind and someone says, present your mind and I'll fix it. And you can't find it. Well, then that's obviously not the problem. Because that's obviously not what, what, if it can't be found, it can't be subject to, to the rules of the universe around you as you see other things. It can't be subject to pressure. Your mind can't be under pressure. That's impossible. It's just a really good modern uh, coin. Yeah, it's a modern phrase. You cannot, your soul can't be crushed. <laughs> Those are impossibilities. If you really comprehend what it is that, that are the qualities that you're talking about, if you are able to perceive beyond thinking if you're able to and i use those words very <laughs> carefully yeah um, if you're able to to experience that's a better one if you're able to experience uh, beyond your current levels of experience all that you find are new levels of experience and those levels of experience will have their own contrasting limits so just in the way that the mind the, the thinking contrast the, the goal-oriented contrasting mind of reference, it falls into a trap and you move on, you, you finally show yourself that's a dead end for, what, for that goal. It's great for, you know, building a house, but it's really terrible at answering the question, what, what am I? What do I mean by I? Then don't fall into the, the illusion that the next, the next kind of tool is the correct one. Yeah? The next kind of tool is just another tool that comes to play that answers that question, maybe. But it brings up other questions that it can't answer. And eventually you have to run into the wall and show yourself that even that tool fails. 
and only then do you soften and there's another one and so then you get to um you get to the the workings of and i love this i say this all the time to you guys <clears throat> uh, i i'm pretty sure that it was ramped up but it could have been Gurdjieff. i'm not i'll have to double check that um who like back in the 1900s who said to one of his disciples nashram the the man said please give me a method um i i'll do anything you ask i i want to free myself from this guilt that i have or i can't remember the exact story um, something happened, I feel so guilty, I need to, to free myself from the guilt. Can you give me, a, what do I have to do? And, and the, the master says, there's no method. You ask for a method, okay. Uh, get up at dawn, stand on one leg, and uh, bark like a chicken. <laughs> Every day for 20 years. And, um, and, then, and then you'll be free. And the man goes, oh, thank God. <laughs> and what, what, the, what the teacher's trying to point out is, there isn't, there's no method. There's no method. There's only further layers of confusion. But you will not accept that until you've shown yourself that to be true. So until you have ended all possibility of answering your question with that method, to the point where you're willing to try something beyond that, um, up until that point, you're, you're, not, you're not convincible. Yeah? You, are, you are like a rock. And you need to turn into... The process of that will grind you into into powder yeah that's that that idea um one of my favorite comments from the prophet from Khalil gibran's book from the night from 1927 when he talks about pain and suffering um and he his comment and he's writing this as a he's a sufi poet a beautiful persian poet um and he writes this this line saying something like don't quote me on the book something like um all of this pain all this suffering you you must endure it's a process so that it takes you, like wheat, you're, you're, um, you're harvested from the fields. You're grown from seed, you know, you push through the sprout, and then you're, you're battered by the rain and heated by the sun, and you're, you're threshed, harvested from the fields with, with metal tools and sickles and scythes. You're taken and you're threshed to separate your, your, um, uh, your grains from the, from the stem. And then you're, you're um, crushed to separate your husk and free your husk, and then you're ground into powder, into whiteness and pliancy so that you can be um, mixed with water and, and moulded into a bread so that you can be burned at incredible temperatures in an oven to be turned into bread that is suitable for God. <laughs> and it's, it's a beautiful, like if you, th if you just take that beyond a, a religious connotation, that is, regardless of your spiritual ideologies, that's, it's such a beautiful concept that... This, these, 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 um, these experiences are, are character shaping. You know, we, I was talking to, uh, to Scott, Scott Romero, if you're watching this, we had a wonderful chat um, last week when he came to pick up the mats. And it was just, it was just a, around this idea that, um, that goodness isn't goodness by, ver by, by accident, yeah? Someone can't be good. I know, I know, you should totally quote from the book, Jeff. Um, I have it up there, I think, actually. Someone, someone can't be good by accident. Goodness, moral virtue, is under application. If you, are, if you travel through your whole life and you've never actually found the opportunity where you've had to test your character, you're not a good person. You're not a necessarily a bad person, <clears throat> but you're not a good person. You're just a victim of correct social normity. If you find yourself brought to a point of difficulty and then under duress you make moral decision you make moral choice and that leads you in a particular direction so let's say hypothetical example um here you are the choice is the choice is uh, you're a you're a massively powerful martial artist um you could walk down the street and just manipulate physically and, and mentally and emotionally others into giving you what you want why pay for things just be a thug go into the bakery and just manipulate get the bread for free you know use fear use um use uh, in, like incite uh, worry and doubt and just just take so you say well that's that's an option you know if you have developed skills that's like having a gun if you've developed skills that other people don't necessarily have then you have the potential of using those to your advantage and if you if you have those skills and yet you choose to walk to the bakery and be kind and smile and, um, and interact well and pay for the bread and go out and work and do the labor that gets the money to pay for the bread and take part in that process, then you're doing that out of choice. 
because you, you totally have the opportunity to go and just beat up the cashier and steal the bread. And that would be easy, you know. But you're choosing to respond. You're choosing to take part in a kind way. You're choosing to take part towards a certain moral virtue in a society that you want to be a part of. And under those circumstances, you say, ah, I'm choosing goodness because that's the kind of world I want to, to help to co-create. Then in those moments, you discover that morally and characterly, then you, you're a good person. You could say you're a good person. And by the same token, and this weighs heavy on people's hearts, if someone's grown up in a negative social construct and the, the standard, they're a victim of making bad decisions, they're not necessarily a bad person. It's at the point where they would, they would be faced with the potential, they, they have the character potential within them to do both, to, to, um, to play out kindness or cruelty. Faced with those options, if they choose cruelty, at that moment they become a bad individual. They, they become morally poor. But up until that point, they were a victim of circumstance. And that's a whole philosophy. So what martial arts should do, and get back to the stupa, what martial arts should do, in my view, is it should massively empower individuals to be able to walk out in society and, and observe and understand dynamics and take part and then choose the outcome, choose the moral virtue that they'll take part in. If you want to dwell, if you want to be a member of society, if you want your children to grow up in a society that is um, respectful of the boundaries of other people, let's say that um, there's, no, there, there's, no, there's no great universal law that we can't murder each other. There's a social um, understanding that if we walk around murdering each other, it makes all of our lives very difficult and and we can't trade, we can't work together. So I agree not to walk around and murder people and they agree not to walk around and murder me. And that, that all works, that's all really good, yeah? But if that's the only reason that you're not out murdering people, well, you're just a victim of the, of the current social paradigm. If you walk around and you're like, you know what, I love people, I love interacting with humans. I'm so excited, I go and I buy my bread from the bakery and she's got some great story, the cashier's got some amazing thing, or that she made the bread, I can't make bread, that's an amazing skill, I'm in awe of, um, and, and this mutual respect, I'm in awe of the, the skills and the, the processes that this person has, then I choose, I choose to, to want to help to collaborate to their goodness, I want to give money to the cashier so that they can have a better life and they can buy food and so on and so on and so on. So. These, these ideas are not just, I don't just draw them up on the, on the wall um, because it's a good pastime. I talk about this a lot in class and, and do a lot of presenting of this to you guys as students to, to help you understand that this is a tool for physical manipulation of the form in a martial art context. Roll the shoulders, so roll the head, fu, off the top of the shoulders, and the pyramid point will, will collapse over the, the ball and sui. And then you'll roll the shoulders off the ball of the belly, and eventually the ball will roll off the structure of the legs and the individual will have collapsed to the ground, yeah? These, these are, we talk about this a lot, so I'm not going into that now, I'm not gonna get up on taijutsu. But on a philosophical level, it's really important that you understand that you can't find you in that. You can't find moral, you can't find virtue, you can't find code. None of that exists there. And for as long as you look for yourself in areas that, that can't possibly be you, you'll just keep, you'll keep finding, not sadness, you'll keep finding disappointment, <laughs> good thing, and eventually you'll be willing to look somewhere else. And with different eyes, you know, you'll, you'll put these eyes up and you'll move on. So, I just realised, I look at the clock, and it is five past nine. <laughs> I've had a good run tonight. Uh, I'll stick around for a little bit after the video, and if you want to, um, to chit-chat, write up comments in the post, I'd love to, to have some dialogue back and forward. Uh, remember that everyone in the, um, uh, I think I put it up, I don't think I put it up on the Facebook page, but I have put it up in the, the group chat, so let me know if you didn't get this message. Tomorrow, Saturday, April the 18th, 2020 at 2 p.m. in the afternoon, we're having our Zoom party. So it's a social gathering, get together. Um, I'll send out the Zoom invite link uh, in the group chat. If you are not a part of that and you want to be, comment on this video and I'll make sure that you're a part of the group chat or at least I'll make sure that you, um, you get the, the URL invite. And hopefully I'll see you tomorrow at two o'clock 
Um, happy birthday to Lucy, it was her birthday during the week, and I've, got a, I'm, I've made a note of the birthdays coming up over the next few months, so I'll be calling out to you in birthday uh, love across internet land. If you have any um, particular, if, if you have anything you want to share, remember you can always email me, write to me, um, call me, I'm at home, <laughs> or at the dojo doing things, but I, you know, pretty, pretty, <laughs> got a lot of time on my hands at the moment, more than happy to, to chat. I hope you're all well, lots of love to you all, and I will see you next time. Bye.